Hello YouTubers. Joe Kersey here on uh, October 12, 2013 around a little after 3 in the afternoon Eastern Time. I must remark that this is the true Columbus Day. No, Monday is not Columbus Day. That's a federal holiday or a work holiday. You know, on October 12, 1492, Columbus sighted, uh, made landfall or sighted at any rate, uh, uh, what they think, and they're still not quite sure where he landed. Uh, but they're more or less sure there's always that degree of uncertainty. Uh, somewhere in what we now call the Bahamas, or uh, as the Spanish called them uh, uh, for a while, the San Salvador Islands. Yes, I know. It was horrible. It ruined, it ruined all the new, it ruined the, the Western Hemisphere's indigenous peoples, oh, it was horrible, it was terrible, it was so oppressive, you know, we destroyed the ecology, oh, it was awful. Give me a break, just give me a break. Good for Columbus, you know, he was a, he was an entrepreneur, now, he was kind of a <laughs> charlatan entrepreneur, but he lucked out. And, you know, let's remember how he ended up. He ended up being taken back to Spain in chains on one of his own boats. So, let it be a lesson to us all. Now, uh, from the ridiculous to the sublime. Uh, as I had mentioned, this, this was a funeral, funeral day, Saturday. We are going to have a kind of a double funeral and uh, indeed we did and indeed I read and uh, and, car and carried one of the urns now if you've seen me sort of lurching around on the porch you know I, I have to admire the courage of whoever selected me to <laughs> carry one of these urns you know it's like you know don't drop the urn. That would not be a suave move. Don't drop the urn. Uh, I didn't. And neither did the, uh, the deacon who carried the other urn. But you know, you, you know just don't drop the urn. So... Uh, you know, it all went off very well. I mean, we had, there were probably about 30, 35 family members there. Um, uh, and, and I, you know, and some of these family members had flown in from all over the world. Um, I guess one, one of them lives in Switzerland with her husband. And, uh, and then in addition to the family members, you know, which have become widely dispersed, although I guess a number of them live in South Carolina. That's why... That's why Phil and Pat moved back down there their last oh, six or so years of life. Uh, yeah, about six years of life. Yeah, well, he died in 2010. She died here uh, April of last, this last spring. <coughs> and, uh, but they had gone down there about two and a half, three years before. Oh, man, I've got these bees all over me. Well, anyway, so... Uh, so South Carolina, you know, and and uh, friends, friends had friends had come in uh, uh, from you know many parts of the country, and then of course, uh, actually, interestingly, in uh, uh, Pat Pat worked for the Red Cross, as I said, and and was well was on the board of directors and involved nationally, and she she was sent all over the world as kind of a Red Crossy person, and. Uh, she had to, 
Well, with, you know, her husband had been in the diplomatic service after his naval career, and uh, uh, so she knew people all over the world. And uh, so we had, a, we had a fellow fly in from communist China. Uh, uh, you know, because he knew, well, he knew both of them, but he particularly knew Pat. And uh, so, you know, it was, it was quite the international gathering. Uh, we probably had a total of about, well, we had, we had about 10, 10 people from our congregation there. I was very surprised we didn't get more of a turnout for that. Um, you know, uh, first of all, the this family, I think I mentioned their last name, I won't mention it again, uh, has been in Delaware since, you know, like eight, like 1800. And in fact, when we went to the cemetery, I mean, you know, there were one grave I noticed was uh, so-and-so, 1810 to 1885. You know, plus, uh, since, as you might guess from the fact that both these people were in their 90s, well, you know, Phil, well, Phil was in his 90s, well, so was Pat. Um, but the, the, uh, this particular family, uh, you know, patrilineal descendants at any rate, uh, lived, for quite, lived for quite some time. So, I mean, you know, somebody who was 75 in the 1800s, you know, you know and had fought in the Civil War, or, you know, they, you've got to be kind of genetically tough to do that. So um, it's it's a it's an old Delaware County family and a Delaware City family, uh, for that matter. Now Pat was originally from South Carolina, and uh, she was quite the. Uh, you know, she married this young naval officer. You know, and uh, then off he goes to fighting the war and uh, as I mentioned to you he he had fought in the Battle of Midway now he was not one of the uh, torpedo bombers well we all know there was only about one of them that survived and then the dive bombers had a little bit better record uh, but he was he was a fighter pilot uh, he had provided fighter cover and uh, of course you know like 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 many military people uh, who have been in actual combat, they they rarely will talk to other people about this, except that maybe they'll they'll talk to other military people about it, but they rarely talk to outsiders about it. And uh, um, apparently, uh, this retired judge buddy of mine got filled a talk about this one night uh, you know and, and I, I guess the most he could get him to say was you know the judge asked him you know well did you strafe anything and hit anything that you know of and 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 he says well he says I, I you know I, I, I flew down and strafed he says but I have no idea whether I hit anything and that was about that that was it so you know I mean, it wasn't like he told the judge to shut up. He just, you know, obviously, obvious to the judge that the man didn't want to say anymore. I've been privileged on three occasions to hear people who have been uh, in combat situations open up. And it's uh, very humbling to hear them talk about that. I, I can't imagine what it's like. I've read, a, I've read a lot about it, but that's it. Well, so anyway, uh, the one other story I'll tell you about this man is that uh, uh, when he was in the diplomatic corps, I'd mentioned that he had been in uh, Germany for well, he'd been in Germany a long time, but it wasn't just in Berlin. He was all over the place. Now, was he in 
Was he in the CIA? Is this a cover? We don't know. The story has yet to be told, and for that matter, if it can be told, it has yet to be declassified. And uh, although uh, I did get a sense from some people that the man had written some stuff down, you know, that at an appropriate time might get published. But in any case, on a more personal, local note, as far as the church is concerned, uh, uh, this this guy liked to build clocks. Sometimes he would, now it's not like he took the brass stock and machined out each part, but he would, he would, uh, he would get movements and rebuild them and, you know, polish them, you know, make them work better. And, and then sometimes he would just merely build, I shouldn't say merely build a case for them. Uh, he, uh, uh, yeah, he, he would build a case and, and he would fit the movement in. And, and, uh, so, uh, when he was in, uh, Germany, he traveled back and forth to Berlin and, and, he was able to travel somewhat in East Germany at that time. This was in the late 50s and early 60s. Well, late 50s and then just until the Berlin Wall was built, and then that pretty much shut down the going back and forth into East, East Berlin and East Germany. <clears throat> so, uh, well, he, had been, he had become friends with some, how should we say, People, people from the, the previous regime, i.e. the Nazis, who had ended up in the intelligence services of both West Germany and East Germany. And uh, knowing, knowing this man's interest in clocks, let me check something here, guys. Sorry. Knowing this man's it's, oh go away. Knowing this man's interest in clocks, uh, a fella a fella in East Germany who who made these movements, you know, he and he would do it from the brass stock. You know, he'd take the brass stock and machine it down and make the clock movements. And this was a pendulum clock, about it was one of these uh, well it was a half meter, half meter long pendulum. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, he, uh, so, uh, Phil wanted to bring one of these things back to the United States. And so, well, of course, he couldn't take the whole movement back out intact. Uh, and he particularly couldn't travel out of between West Berlin and West Germany, you know, because they have to be searched, you know. Now, now, it's odd because he had diplomatic immunity, so I don't know how... Well, of course, maybe his cover was that he wasn't a diplomat, or, or, or you know, maybe, maybe he was, had diplomatic immunity, but in order to conform to his cover, who knows. In any case, so these, these, three, these three guys, you know, he and, and, and uh, the two sort of German accomplices, one, interestingly, one, one a communist accomplice and one a, a, you know, a West German accomplice, uh, broke this... Uh, clock movement down into a series of, you know, three, you know, a group of three sets of parts that they just carried, they just carried through in their pocket like change, you know. That was before you had to put everything on the tray table and run it through, you know. And so he brought this movement back to the United States and reassembled it and, uh, and then built a case for this, this clock and it's in our, uh, well, it was, it was in what you thought formerly was our church library, which is now our, our sort of fellowship meeting, you know, conference roomy area that we have in the main church building. And, uh, and it's, it's one of these things, it's one of these clocks you wind every week, you wind it once a week, and it's, it's an eight-day clock, you wind it once a week. And uh, the, uh, the fellow that that had been, uh, well, Phil had, Phil had always wound it when he was still at the church. And then after he left, uh, my judge buddy took over it, 
took it over. And he, he said to me today that, you know, when he cacks off, that job will fall. <laughs> that job will fall to me. So. Now we've 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 pledged to read at each other's funeral. This judge and I, you know, I I said, well, you can read at mine. And he said, well, if you you know you can read at mine. So it's like you know, who goes first? <laughs> you know, and, and we were talking about you know his wife knows that. So I mean we you know Sharon knows so. <laughs> I guess I get to wind the clock too if he goes first. I don't I don't know what people would get to do. You know, who, who, what, you know, if I go first, what <laughs> what'll fall to people to do, you know? I guess, you know, we'll have to get an extra reader somewhere, I guess. So, uh, uh, you know, got all dressed up in my, what I like to call it, my dress, the alb, and, uh, you know, lift the candles, kind of like tick the tires, light the fire, strap down and aim it, you know, like the jet pilots say, and, uh, and uh, uh, got to read at the new lectern, or the, well, the new old lectern, the 1904 lectern that they had recently installed, and, uh, Actually, uh, I could, you know, I guess, I guess my eyes, you know, sort of like from my, the bridge of my nose up was visible. Um, so I could do a certain amount of eye contact. Now, eye contact isn't, in this type of reading isn't all that important. But, uh, you know, it's nice to be able to cast a glance out at your audience, you know. And, uh, you know, and a funeral, a funeral is the one time, well, ideally every time should be, but if you're, if, you know, if you can only do something word perfect and intonation perfect, you know, once, you absolutely want to do it, be that way at a funeral. I mean, people remember funerals. The family certainly does, but, you know, the general public does as well, you know, if they have any notion of caring about the star of the show, so to speak. Well, so that went well, and, and uh, so uh, uh, Charles, our rector, did a tremendous eulogy, well, or, or homily. He... He, he is very good at funeral orations. He really is. Uh, you know, you know, he's, he's good in general, although his emphasis is not what I would wish. But, but on funerals, he is dead on. No, no pun intended. <laughs> no, he's dead on. And, uh, or as he says, he says he puts the fun in funeral. <laughs> the F-U-N in funeral. He, he does, you know, it's he does good stuff on funerals, and uh, and then uh, we had uh, there were three people that knew the deceased that that spoke, uh, and uh, very much to the point. Uh, one of them waxed on a little bit long, but they were all very well. I mean, they were all very articulate. This wasn't some somebody who got up there and you know talked about, you know, using a can opener in the woman's kitchen or something, you know. I mean, they were all very much to the point. Uh, so, you know, and we didn't, it, we, it, it was not a Eucharist or a communion service. We didn't do a communion. Uh, we did, it was, a, we did the burial office right one, fortunately. Now, of course, and I'm going to have to say this again. Well, I guess I shouldn't say, of course. I mean, there was no guarantee this was going to happen, was it? Uh, but uh, we didn't say the Apostles' Creed. Well, I've had my say about that. Now, I, I did remark to the judge that, uh, uh, you know, if, if Phil knew that they weren't doing the Apostles' Creed, 
you know, his ashes would reconstitute themselves and sort of rise up out of the urn like a genie and strike down somebody. Oh, by the way, it's very interesting. Uh, Pat, his, you know, his wife had a very sort of a standard looking urn. But Phil's urn was in the shape of one of these mantle clocks. You know, they've got the little handle on it. It wasn't like a pendulum mantle clock, but it was a, it was a, it was a like a mantle clock. So it was about a, uh, a, uh, a ten by ten by seven box. You know, it had a clock face. You know. And uh, that's that's just neat as anything, I think, because uh, of course that's that was one of his passions. Uh, well, I, I I shouldn't use that word; that's an overused word. Uh, one of his major interests and skills. I just wonder if that was one of his cases that he had built that hadn't been uh, hadn't had a movement installed. Uh, that somehow somebody was able to convert into a you know, a container for the bag. You know, they, they the ashes are generally in a bag. You know, you know they just shove this bag into whatever container. You know, I mean, some. You know, it depends on the state you're in, and you know. I imagine his ashes. I imagine his ashes were in a bag. Although, you know, in Ohio, uh, I've seen the ashes. You can just pour them right out. So. In any case, it was a neat, a neat urn case, if you will. Maybe the maybe the actual urn was inside this this clock case. So I got to carry Phil, uh, and the deacon carried Pat, which gets me actually to sort of what was my originating idea for this piece. Uh, uh, when I was involved actively in medicine uh, we're talking about people who died in the hospital and who who may or may not be with them in the hospital and sometimes the family's there and sometimes the family's not and uh, and of course you know sometimes somebody's there who uh, you know is involved in you know an employee of the hospital but you don't you don't know who they're going to be I mean you don't know I mean so you know the idea was that, you know you never know who's going to attend you at your at your death uh, much as much as when you're born uh, you don't know who's going to be attending you at your birth um, and I got thinking well you know an analogous somewhat somewhat analogous situation is uh, when when you die or you know after you after you are dead um, I remember when I first started going to St. Peter's in 1995 uh, you know this this guy was always very kind to me and spoke to me and it was very clear this this fellow was a you know, a massively high quality individual. You know, and uh, he, he was not in the common run of human beings, I'll tell you that right now. Well, we're all equal in the eyes of God, but, you know, you know he had a way of conducting himself, and so forth. So, uh, over the years, um, Let's see now. He died in 2010, and they uh, so so around 2006 he started to deteriorate. Now he didn't deteriorate mentally. His mind was absolutely sharp as anything. I understand it right up to the end. But you know he had a tremendous amount of spinal arthritis and, and joint arthritis, and uh, uh, he had he had uh, uh, actually. Uh, Sort of a, a you know, lumbar stenosis problems in his lower spine, and uh, he had this several operations, and and I think he, I don't know if he had hip replacements and knee replacements, but 
he was he was troubled by a lot of severe pain uh, to the point that he couldn't really uh, well he couldn't move around much on his own uh, he, he needed some help and he ended up going into one of the assisted living areas of one of the local rest homes and and uh, Pat moved in with him at you know the last couple of years before they moved down to South Carolina and, and uh, uh, but but occasionally he'd still come to church. They'd make make it a church. Pat would Pat would come if he, if Phil couldn't come. Pat would come anyway. But but more often than not, Phil would would be with her. And um, you know he he got so he wouldn't go up and take communion. So people you know they'd bring communion down to him in the pew and uh, uh, and and uh, you know whenever I was there in the line going up to take communion you know, I, I was on the side where they sat and so it logistically worked out I could, I could pat him on the shoulder you know as I went by and, uh, and he always seemed to appreciate that and I got thinking to myself well you know today I got thinking to myself you know little did I know when I started going to this church in 1995 that I'd be carrying you know the, the earthly remains of this man you know, you know, into and out of the church. Uh, Eighteen years later, so it's a, it's it's sort of analogous to we don't know we don't know who's going to be with us when we die, and uh, you don't you don't know who's going to carry you down that aisle. and back out just like you don't know who's gonna you know carry you from the immediate area of delivery over to the various you know immediate immediate post infant birth activities uh, interesting uh, Interesting idea, I think. Well, I think I think that's about it. So on that note, I'm going to say bye bye, YouTubers. I've not seen any deer today, but I'll see if I can show you a little bit of the creek here. Alrighty now, bye bye. I spoke hastily. Uh, so uh, after the service, uh, I helped I helped the altar guild people uh, sort of break down the altar, you know, rearrange things and get things kind of ready for tomorrow, you know, on Sunday. And uh, then I was able, to, I, you know, I, I, I thought, well, I'm going to miss the interment because they were, these guys, they all went up to this cemetery, which is only about a three quarters of a mile down the road. They were going to inter Phil and Pat in a, you know, a, it was actually interred in a ground grave, but, you know, they're, they're ashes, you know, that, that's often done. And, uh, And I was this very old cemetery. I mean, you've got graves in there from the early 1800s. And uh, and the, the, this particular family's got a big, big, big area where they're all, you know, buried. And uh, so, uh, but I was able to get there just in time to see the uh, uh, the military service. <clears throat> you had a there was a, a commander. Uh, which, which was Phil's uh, uh, rank when he retired from the Navy. And uh, he commanded the Honor Guard, which, uh, I, as near as I could tell, consisted of uh, uh, 
local VFWs, uh, people, and uh, there were a couple of people from the high school Air Force ROTC, and uh, and of course he he and the enlisted man. I mean, they were the actual you know people that that were handling the the flag and the family and so forth and the. Uh, uh, the 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 chief petty officer had like look look somewhere over eight eight of these hash marks on his sleeve. Now I don't know exactly what that means, but uh, uh, and when they fired the fired the, the the three volley salute. Now I I have to say that that two of, two of the people and it. it they worked out okay. It didn't matter. Two of the people uh, f uh, fired on aim on the first on the first volley, but the other other subsequent volleys went off fine. And uh, uh, and uh, I, you know, a fellow played taps. Now I I don't know if this guy actually was playing taps or whether he had one of these trumpet shape things that that can play taps that looks like the guy you know if he holds up to his lips it looks like he's playing taps but taps was played either manually or electronically and if it, if it was electronically it sure almost didn't quite sound electronic and I'm glad I got there in time to see that and of course they gave the the son and well they gave the oldest child of the flag which I think was the son but uh, they gave it to uh, I think they gave it to the, the, the older daughter of the two daughters so uh, insects bees bugs well, so that was, that was, uh, I'm glad I got there for that. Uh, you know, sometimes when you get helping break down things after the service, you can get sort of sucked into this morass. Uh, like there was a, the table on which their urns rested. I, I actually was fueling up to carrying this thing back over to the parish house where where it generally resides. Yeah. This thing's this thing's made out of walnut. And when I say made out of walnut, you know, this isn't this isn't walnut veneer. This is like the top's like about this thick walnut about with with this these these curved stylistic legs. Somebody's done a heck of a job on this, so you know that walnut's dense wood. That that bad boy was heavy, and I'm not. I tend to be a bit of a wuss on these things. So. Um, I think that I think that finally concludes today's lesson here, guys. Alrighty.